The bell was rung at Her Majesty's prison five times daily, including at sunrise. It signaled the beginning of work in the salt ponds of the island. The salt industry is our history. Jamaica, Barbados, the Dominican Republic, and other islands provided sugar, rum, and molasses. The Turks and Caicos provided salt. At one time, our islands were the greatest provider of salt in the Western world. On the backs of our labor, Newfoundland and New England cod were salted and fed the world. Fortunes were made in Bermuda based on our raking and bagging the white gold. During this time, the American colonists had a revolution and later a civil war. We provided salt to the crown through it all. Many people have come and gone. The world has changed. We, the belongers, whose ancestors worked in the salt ponds from the 1680s to the 1980s, and who came here either as slaves or industrialists, are still here. This is our history. You, you have the fellows and the pawn breaking the soil up, and you have two men with the rake raking the soil together. Samuel Simmons is a native of the Turk Islands, where he grew up and worked as a boy in the salt ponds. And they, they will continue that for the whole day. The break ups breaking up the soil, and the rakes raking the soil together for the carts, you know, to demand the carts to take up. And then we used to like help my grandfather chop down the soil. I remember me as a little boy, like nine, ten years old, toting soil and sex because that's how they grew up. So they, instead of them, when they get older and it was still going on, they used to make us do that, put the salt in the sacks. It's hard work, but like us young men, we used to go along with it just like you, you know, you get used to it. I remember up to when they used to come home restless, tired. When they get in the house, they can hardly do anything because their bodies are breaking up from the hard work. We were so used to that, that it was just like nothing to you. You walking on the soil, bare feet the whole time. I mean, shoving it in and then you go down to the heat, you shove it out with your, your feet in the soil. They had no shoes. They were all barefeeted. Sometimes they're coming home with cuts on their feet, with cons on their feet. And the first time they really started wearing shoes was like maybe even the 60s. For the heat of the sun, we, we, the eyes used to burn us very much. So we decided after that to get a coolness. You know, you had the date, the date tree in the yard there on the south side of Baptist Chapel has a very big, great, great, great tree, big tree. And so we used to go there to get the leaves, big broad leaves. We put it on the hour. We used to use some um, cagus hats then. Hats come from cagus. You put it on your hat to shave, to shave your eyes. And then we put that on, oh, you just like you just could see. Tim Dunn, a former lawyer from the U.S., left the corporate world to become a resident of Grand Turk. So the Turks Island's uh, solar salt operation was relatively simple. Uh, it was basically a three-step process. They flooded the low-lying main reservoir through a canal which was cut directly to the sea. Um, the canal would have been flooded at high tide, the sluice gates were opened and the water would flow in. Uh, once the tide was high and it was going back out, they'd lower the gates obviously to hold the water back in the main reservoir. The main reservoir was then used to flood the larger ponds further away from the road here in Salt Key. Um, the water would sit there for anywhere from two to three weeks, uh, at which point it would concentrate approximately ten times. At that point, the pickle, as they called it, was ready to be moved to the smaller settling ponds, or the making pans, which were roughly a quarter acre in size. Uh, those pans uh, would be flooded using the windmills to pump the water from the larger ponds to the making pans. Uh, at which point the water would sit for only two or three days. During that two or three days, most of the salt would precipitate out of the solution uh, and they would be left with anywhere from 16 to 24 inches of salt in the beds of the ponds. 
that was uh, the initial steps of the salt making process. It was very easy in a sense that it was the sea, the wind, and the sun doing all the work. The human labor involved was minimal. It wasn't until the salt actually precipitated out of the solution that the fun started. And that was extracting the salt from the beds of these making pans uh, and collecting it in order to ship it overseas. When he's not working as a dive master, Tim Dunn spends time maintaining a historic home called the White House which has been in his family for generations. The White House was built between 1820 and 1830, and I'm a seventh generation descendant of Daniel Harriet, the builder. It's a monument to the Turks Island salt trade, built right after the period of peak prosperity uh, in the Turks Island salt trade, which was between 1780 and, and about 1820. The White House is the largest stone structure in the Turks Islands, and the stor salt storage facility beneath it held hundreds of tons of salt, which was important because you could store salt and still have salt to ship even when you couldn't make it, which could last for years depending on the weather. When it was shipped, it was loaded into half bushel bags, which were burlap sacks, and those bags were loaded onto small sailboats anywhere from 14 to 18 feet in length, at which point it was ferried out to the ships that were anchored in the deep water two or three hundred yards from shore. Those ships were either Bermuda sloops or later on schooners uh, and ultimately clipper ships. There were a lot of small causes to the ultimate collapse of the Turks Island salt trade, but there were a couple of very important ones. Perhaps the most important was the discovery of salt in North America, which happened in about 1830 or between 1830 and 1840. However, the salt business, the salt trade, continued on for another 150 years. So that wasn't the, the, the main cause. However, the advent of refrigeration, which uh, obviated the need to use salt to preserve, to preserve fresh meat and fish, uh, was another significant blow. But ultimately, it was the small size of the capacity of Grand Turk Salt Key in South Caicos, coupled with the fact that there wasn't a deep water harbor in any of the islands, that made the cost of shipping excessive. The value of the salt ultimately was less than it cost to ship it to market. Still visible on many Turk islands, the Salinas are now simple, quiet reminders of our once booming salt industry. The undisturbed relics are nestled among the natural beauty that has drawn so many from around the world to come and visit. We are proud of our heritage in Turks and Caicos, and we are proud to welcome you to our islands and to share with you this important chapter in the history of our great land.